Good, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining this uh, this share. This will be the last in the um, series on Bircha Samazen, on benching. Um, apologies for the uh, interruption over the last couple of weeks, but um, it's nice finally to be uh, to be able to uh, continue with the share. Um, for those who missed the earlier ones in the series, they are all available on our uh, YouTube channel for Nair. Um, I've also posted, and we'll post again a link in the um, in the chat to uh, a text of Bircha Samazen. If you don't have uh, a copy of a Siddha or um, a Bencher with you, then uh, you can click on this link and that will give you a, um, a copy of the text of Bircha Samazen, because we will be looking this week at the text of the final Bracha, the fourth of the four blessings of Bircha Samazen. Now, in the last few weeks, um, we looked at the first three, the text of the first three brachas. Um, the first three brachas were all of Torah origin um, and certainly date very far back into um, the earliest times in Jewish history. We saw that the first bracha was written by Moshe, the second by Yehoshua, and the third by David and Shlomo. The theme of the first bracha is universal nutrition. The theme of the second bracha is unique relationship that we have with Hashem, the covenant, and Eretz Israel, as we discussed. And the theme of the third bracha is the Beis HaMikdosh and Yerushalayim and the Malchus, the kingship of David. The fourth bracha, in contrast, is a fairly late addition to the text of Bechaz HaMazen, um, and it dates back to post the destruction of the Beis HaMikdosh. In fact, um, more than 60 years after the destruction of the second Beis HaMikdosh. So we're talking roughly in the year 130 in the common era, um, and therefore quite a late text um, of, uh, of, of the Nusach of Tzvillah. The Amidah, for example, dates back to the Amshik Nasser's Gdolish, when Nasser is about 400 years before the common era. Um, the text of Birchas Hamazon itself, as we said, dates back to Moshe, Yeshua, and David Amalach. So we're talking about a thousand plus years before the common era. However, the uh, text of the fourth bracha is a late edition, and it was written on the um, tragic occasion of the Beitar Rebellion. And um, I mentioned this at the beginning of the series on Birch's on Birch so I'm not going to go into it in too much um, detail. But some 60 years after the destruction of the Beis HaMikdosh, the Beis HaMikdosh was destroyed roughly 70 on the common, of the common era. Some 60 years later, around about the year 130, um, Beitar was the center of the Bar Kokhba Rebellion, a rebellion against the Roman Empire. Um, ultimately unsuccessful and squashed by um, Hadrian, the Caesar, the Roman Caesar Hadrian. And um, when the Romans defeated Bar Kokhba's army, and there's a lot of uh, remains that can still be seen in, uh, in uh, the region around uh, Beitar, um, they slaughtered many um, soldiers and many of the civilian citizens of Beitar. And uh, didn't allow the Jewish people to bury the dead, to, uh, to uh, bring them to Kavura. Um, after many years, Rabban Gamliel um, was allowed to, um, the Nossi, Rabban Gamliel was the prince of the remaining Jewish population in Eretz Israel from the family of Hillel, and he was finally given the right to bury the, the dead from Beitar, and found miraculously that the bodies were still um, fresh and able to be buried. And in commemoration of this little miracle in the midst of a very dark time in Jewish history, this exultant and beautiful bracha of Bircha Samozen was composed, the fourth blessing of Bircha Samozen. Now in a few moments we will look at the text of the bracha in detail, but a brief glance will show us that the bracha is, is really a, an incredible um, blessing. It's a blessing overflowing with appreciation of love of Hashem, of praise of Hashem as our, our, our father, our king, our um, redeemer, our creator, um, who looks after us, who shepherds us. Um, an incredible um, text of a, a nusach, a text of a bracha, full of confidence in the goodness of Hashem and his um, care and love and everything that he gives us. And recognition that he gives us uh, and success and bracha and redemption and comfort and consolation and livelihood and sustenance and mercy. It's an incredible bracha full of praise of Hashem. That's really the theme of the bracha. In halachic terminology, the bracha is known as the bracha of Tatov Vahamativ, 
God who is, is good and causes or does goodness. And that's really the theme of the bracha, the goodness of Hashem. So why do we say um, such a bracha in Birch Hazamaz? And why was it composed at the time of the deep and dark tragedy of Beitar? Um, and how does that connect to Birch Hazamaz? And how does it connect to, to benching? And the answer to the question is that Beitar was indeed a, a dark time. It was probably the darkest time in Jewish history um, for, for till, till really till the Holocaust. It was a, a time of absolute desolation. And uh, really when, when the Jewish people in many ways hit rock bottom, and yet they were able to declare through uh, the experience of the small kindness of being able to bring their dead to Kavuras Israel, and they were able to declare exultantly the goodness and recognize the goodness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And therefore the theme of this bracha is taking um, the pre-exile awareness and relationship of um, us to Hashem and transporting that into the darkness of exile. So the first three brachas, which are the brachas min HaTorah, as we saw in previous weeks, are instructed to us as we left Egypt, as we were traveling through the desert, and they, they are incredible brothers. They are brothers whose purpose is, when we see the kindness of Hashem, to convert all food into mon, as we described, when the mon falls from the skies and um, is clearly lechem min God-given bread, we then enter Eretz Yisrael, and in Eretz Yisrael, where we um, draw our food and our, our nutrition from the ground, we might think that this is achieved through our own uh, riches, through our own um, uh, um, success, through our own might, through our hard work. And therefore the bracha of Beichas um, Hamazon is an attempt to remind us, despite the comforts and the luxuries of everything that we have, no, nonetheless, we need to recognize this comes from Hashem. So the first three brachas are very much um, Israel-centered brachas, and brachas centered round a time of, of safety and security um, the second bracha is, the first bracha is about, is about nutrition from Hashem. The second bracha is about Eretz Yisrael. The third bracha is about the Beis HaMikdosh and Yerushalayim. So, so how are we able to continue these brachas through to the darkness of exile? The answer is through the fourth bracha. The fourth bracha allows us to recognize Hashem in the time of darkness, in the time of exile. So this is the nature of the fourth bracha of the Amida. It's a bracha that translates the brachas of the first three blessings, which are Torah blessings, and takes them into the era of the fourth bracha, the era of goddess, of darkness, and recognizing Hashem even in darkness. Interestingly and fascinatingly, the Chazal bring a, a story linking um, Hadrian himself, Hadrian, the, the um, slaughterer of Beitar, the, the leader, the Roman general and later emperor who massacres the rebels in Beitar, as he himself recognizes this unique quality. And the Gemara brings a, a story that Hadrian, the emperor, recognized the um, greatness of Khal Yisrael and was led to recognize the greatness of Hashem through the quality of Kivso, a lamb, Ho'omedet bein shivim ze'evim, who stands between 70 wolves. In other words, there were times in Jewish history where we saw the greatness of Klal Yisrael and the relationship we had with Hashem through the conquest of the lands of Canaan, through the Mon, through the Beis HaMikdosh, through Yerushalayim, through the covenant we have with Hashem, as described in the earlier brachas. But then Hadrian says, I now recognize the might of Klal Yisrael and the relationship with Hashem through, through your weakness, through your vulnerability. How can one lamb survive amongst 70 Z'avin, 70 wolves, only because of divine intervention? So this is the nature of the fourth bracha. It's a bracha of one lamb amongst 70 wolves. It's a bracha of recognizing Hashem even in the deepest and darkest places. And therefore this was added to Bir um, on the commemoration of this very deep and dark time in Jewish history, the massacre of Beitar and its destruction. So this is the introduction to the fourth bracha. And the fourth bracha is separate to the previous three. The previous three are Min HaTorah, or Deraisa obligations. The fourth one is um, Rabbinic, and therefore it's a discrete unit and element. Now, this is indicated with two textual features that show that it is a separate element, a separate unit from the previous three brachas. The first feature is the last words of the previous three brachas is the word Omein. Unusually for Ashkenazim, less unusually for Sephardim. The third bracha, Uvenei Yerushalayim HaKodesh, finished with the word Baruch HaTashem, as we discussed in the Shir on that bracha, normally at least Ashkenazim do not say Amen to their own bracha, and even Sfadim most of the time don't do so. 
because it doesn't seem to make sense to say Amen to Yom Racha. Amen means I agree, I firmly endorse. That's the meaning of the word Amen. Amen is uh, linked to the word Amen or Emuna, um, firm, that which is held solid and tight and strong. So Amen means I firmly endorse this. Now, what sense does it make to firmly endorse um, a response to one's own bracha? You say bracha, and then you say, I, I endorse it. If someone else says a bracha, I answer amen to their bracha. I say, I endorse what they have said. But why would I endorse a response to my own bracha? Um, so normally we don't do such a thing, but we did do it at the end of a Vene Yoshai Mirakodesh. And the reason we did this was to indicate, amen, I firmly endorse everything I've said. I've now finished the core part of benching in order to indicate that the next bracha is a separate bracha of its own. It's a rabbinic late addition to Berchus HaMozim, as we explained the bracha introduced at the time of the Beitar massacre. So this is one textual clue to the separateness of the fourth bracha. The second clue is that the first three brachas are all in a chain. They're what's called halachically bracha samucha lechaverata, a bracha which continues and is joined and is attached to the previous bracha, and in many cases, the next brachas. Two familiar examples of chains of brothers which link into each other one after another as a chain are the Amida, the Shimon Esra, 18 or 19 brothers all linked together, and Birchas Amazon, the first three brothers all linked together. Now, a feature of linked brothers are that they do not begin with the words Baruch HaTashem and Akeinim Anafolam. So if you look in Benching, and I posted for those who don't have the text of Benching, um, a link where you can download uh, the Nusra for Benching. Um, I'll post it again in the chat for those who have joined later. I either have a Siddur or a Bench in front of you, or, or you can just click on the link and you'll get a, co a copy of the text of Birchaz HaMazen. Birchaz HaMazen, the, the second and third brachas, do not begin with the words Baruch HaTashem. The first bracha starts with the word Baruch HaTashem, and that carries on through to all the other brachas. So each bracha, they're long brachas, they begin with the word Baruch HaTashem and finish with the word Baruch HaTashem. Baruch HaTashem, and then finishes with the word Baruch HaTashem, and then finishes with the word Baruch HaTashem, and then finishes with but the next bracha, Noda and Rachim, don't start with Baruch HaTashem because they are linked to brachas, they're brachas in a chain. However, our bracha, the fourth bracha, does start with Baruch HaTashem because it is not part of this linked chain. It is a separate fourth bracha, not attached to the previous brachas that went ahead of it. So this is the bracha, Samochad HaChaberta, chains linked brachas, and this fourth bracha is its own separate unit. Now let's look at the content of the bracha itself. And the main theme and content of the bracha is really the very simple idea of hatov v'meitiv. There's only features, um, a couple of lines into the bracha, but the bracha, as I said, halachically is known as hatov v'hameitiv, that's the name of the bracha, and that is the core feature of the bracha. And that, even though the bracha has um, many words to it, it, it speaks at, somewhat at length, it is considered a short bracha, it doesn't finish off with the concluding Baruch HaTashem at the end, because it really only has one theme, which is recognizing the goodness of Hashem. And we just express that goodness in many different languages and in many different ways. So I want to focus for a couple of minutes on, for a few more than a couple of minutes, for a few minutes, on some of this language used to express the goodness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and explain um, some features, interesting features of the text. And the first feature I want to uh, point out is that we refer to Hashem three times in this bracha as Melech, as king. Baruch HaTashem Rekeinu Melech HaOlam, Hashem is the king of the universe. Hakel, he's the god, Ovinu. And then we say again, Malkeinu, he is our king. And then we carry on giving praise to Hashem Adireinu, Barinu, he's our creator, he's our redeemer. He forms us, he's our, the holy one before us. He's our shepherd, who shepherds us, etc. And then again, we say HaMelech, the king who is good and does good. So the word melech forms is, appears three times in the bracha, and the Gemara in brachas gives a very fascinating explanation about why this is so. And it says the three times appear in this bracha once to make for, for the bracha itself, every bracha should include the word melech, once to make up for the absence of the word melech in the previous bracha of Rachim, and wants to make up for the absence of Melech in the bracha of Noda. So very interesting, but that both the bracha of Noda, Lecha Hashem Elkeinu, and the bracha of Rachim don't mention the word Melech, don't include that Hashem is Melech Olam is the king. Very unusual in um, brachas. Why do they not include that Hashem is the Melech? Well, Noda doesn't include that Hashem is the Melech, because it is a continuation bracha. So bracha, as we just discussed, which is part of a chain of blessings. 
But then Rachim also doesn't include Hashem as a Melech. It's also part of the chain. However, there's an incongruity about the idea that it doesn't include Hashem as a Melech, because the theme of Rachim is thanking Hashem for the Malchus, the kingship of David HaMelech, and uh, praying for the restoration of this kingship, which is the era of Mashiach. So why does the bracha of Rachim not mention Hashem as a Melech? Surely if we are davening for the restoration of the kingship of Moshiach, we should daven for the restoration of the kingship of Hashem. And the answer is, says the Gemara, because it would be a chutzpah, it would be an insult, it would be a cheek to mention the kingship of Hashem in the same context as the kingship of a human being, of David or Moshiach. No matter how great a human being they are, to compare their kingship to the kingship of Hashem is clearly inappropriate. And therefore we are stuck in a situation which we not praise Hashem appropriately by referencing his kingship in the previous brothers. And therefore we mention the kingship of Hashem three times in this blessing, once for itself and twice to make up for the previous two brothers, which don't mention that Hashem is Melech, that Hashem is the king. Um, and that's why this theme of Malchus appears three times in this blessing, in this bracha. There's another interesting grammatical feature of the bracha, that twice in the bracha, we reference the goodness or um, givingness or uh, bountifulness of Hashem using the language of past, present, and future. And we say, who hateth, who mateth, who hateth, who He hateth, he did good in the past, who mateth, he does good in the present, and who hateth, he will do good for us in the future. We then carry on and we say, who gumlonu, who gumlenu, who gumlenu lot. He allocates for us, allocated for us in the past. He does allocate, he does give us, Gomel, he gives us kindness in the present. And Yigmelenu, he will give us kindness in the future. So we have a past, present, and fu- present future theme in, um, in the Nusach of the Bracha, in the text of this Bracha. And this parallels, again, it's another aspect of paralleling the text of the previous three brothers. When we discussed the previous three brothers, we saw how Hazon, the first bracha of Hashem, was in the present tense, recognizing that Hashem nourishes us and sustains us in, in the present time. Hazon refers to the thanks to Hashem for sustaining and nourishing us, and that's in the present time. Nodelachah, the second blessing, is thanking Hashem in the past tense, for all the gifts he's given us, in particular, the gift of Eretz Yisrael in the past, and Rachim, which is a plea for mercy and the restoration of Yerushalayim and the base of Mikdash, is written in the future tense. So we saw in previous re- weeks how each of the three brachas, are, uh, of the pre- three previous brachas, are written in the past, present, and future tense. This fourth bracha, which was created relatively late in history, as we discussed, in commemoration of the tragedy of Beta, and lifts the dark time of history and reconnects us to the three brachas, Therefore, it's written with reference to these three tenses, past, present, and future, to connect it to the previous three brachas, because the role of this fourth bracha is to allow us to appreciate goodness of Hashem, even in dark times, and therefore it references the three previous brachas and allows us to re-say them anew, and therefore the bracha was constructed to reflect this triple theme of the previous three brachas, past, um, present, and future. Now, the word gomel is an interesting word, Tov means good, goodness. Everything that is good is tov, is good. Um, tov means um, that which is um, works, that which flows, that which operates the way one would want it to operate, as opposed to ra, which literally means that which is broken. So ra, evil, is that which is broken. Tov is that which functions and operates well. Um, for example, just to give you a, a, uh, um, a, a source in the Torah for this translation, the halacha is when the candles need to be um, set up for the menorah in the base of Mikdash to function, to work. It's called tatovas hanoras, the setting up, the, the creating the functionality of the lights in the base of Mikdash. The word toiv means that which works, that which functions. So that's the translation of toiv in this bracha. What's the translation of hu gomelonu, hu gomelenu, hu gomelenu lad? So I translate it as it allocates kindness to us. Like Gemilat Chasodim, Gemilas Chasodim is someone who gives kindness. Um, a very interesting use of words because Gomel means to allocate with care, um, to proportionately and uh, um, apportion kindness. Um, it's linked etymologically to the words Ligmol, to wean, 
or gamal, a camel, which, um, uh, um, which carefully stores and allocates and apportions with care that which it gives out. So gemilat chasadim means to carefully allocate. In other words, even though we think of chesed as an overflowing bounty and an overflowing goodness, in truth, when we do chesed, we have to allocate with care. If we give someone too much, it can overwhelm them. It can overwhelm us. We need boundaries. Sometimes giving someone um, endless gifts and endless kindness actually isn't kind to them. It makes them lose their own self-esteem or perhaps their own um, self-assurance and their ability to look after themselves. So chesed has to be gemilat chesedim, has to be allocated with care. Gemilo means careful allocation. And therefore, that's the second feature that we say. We say Hashem does toiv, he does guv, but also hu gemlonu, 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 he, he weans us, he, he allocates with care and allots to us the goodness that we need and are meant uh, to have. So that's Yig Meleinu La'ad. Um, in addition, we then continue the language of the Tfilah, and we say, We conclude the Bracha, asking Hashem that he shouldn't make us um, lose, lack, be deprived of Cold tov of all that which is good. In other words, after we've been through all these exalt, uh, exultant languages of praise for Hashem, in which we talk about his chesed, his kindness, his mercy, his uh, generosity, his, his uh, bounty, his uh, sustenance, his consolation, his mercy, etc., the life givingness, the peace givingness that he gives, we then say, Yomikul Tov, from all this good, we should never lack. In other words, we're not just asking for all the brachas, all the blessings. Um, but also that Ali Khasraini, we shouldn't lack them, that we should be able to enjoy them. Um, many people, as we know in life, can be given all the blessings in the world and they are, are yet unable to benefit from them. And therefore, Mikul Tur, La'ona Mani Khasraini, we ask not just should we be allocated all these brothers, all these blessings, but also we should never lack all the good that we are granted. We should be able to appreciate all the good that is given to us. <coughs> With this, we conclude the fourth and last bracha of Samatan, and the final words of this bracha are Ali Chasreinu, after which if you hear someone saying the bracha, one should answer Amen, because this is the conclusion of the bracha. And as I already said, unusually for long brachas, it doesn't finish with another baruch Hashem at the end. Normally there's short brachas like Shakol Niyab Dvaru, or Hamot Tzilechem and Oret, which is Das Baruch HaTashem Ekeinu Ma'achodom, Hamot Tzilechem and Oret, or Shakol Niyab Dvaru. And then the long brachas, like the text of the Amida brachas, or indeed the text of the earlier brachas in Birch Samazan, which finish off with another Baruch HaTashem, like Baruch HaTashem, Hazon HaSakol. This bracha doesn't finish off with that Baruch HaTashem, because even though it's a lengthy bracha, it really only has one piece of content, one theme, which is the goodness of Hashem, and therefore it's a short bracha in terms of its content, even though we describe abundantly with multiple language the goodness of Hashem. Now, after we finish this bracha, Birch HaSamoz and Benchin still carries on with a series known as the Harachamons, a series of Harachamon in which we appeal for the mercy and uh, goodness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And uh, these Harachamons date back even more recently in history. They are a relatively new innovation in addition to Birch HaSamoz, and they date back to the era of the Ge'onim, so we're talking somewhere around the year 800, um, 900, that sort of uh, time in history, quite late, late for text of Tefillah to be added. Um, the Ge'onim were the leaders of Babylonian Jewry. They were the Rosh Yeshiva, the heads of the Yeshiva in Bovel in Iraq, in Bovel, which was the center of world Jewry at the time. I've mentioned in the context of these Shurim before, the Ge'onim, um, who, who really spread the Torah to the far-flung corners of Jewish settlements, Europe, Germany, France, Spain, Italy, North Africa, and um, wrote Sidurim and uh, the texts of Tefillos for the Jewish people so they should have them. And they added in these texts of Harachamon as an addition to benching. Now, there are two halachic problems with saying these Harachamons, which the postgame discuss. Um, the first problem is that they seem to be an interruption to um, benching, because um, certainly when one benches a formal benching, at the end of Bechas HaMazon, one is meant to make a bracha on wine, very priagofen on wine, much like many important mitzvahs are done over wine. Um, it's an interesting thing. Um, Kiddush, for example, the declaration of the sanctity of Shabbos is done over wine. 
Now, Kiddush has nothing to do with wine. It's a declaration of the sanctity of Shabbos. Havdalah, which we looked at in the previous mini-series in depth, is said over wine. Now, Havdalah has nothing to do with wine. It's simply a declaration of the sanctity of Shabbos and the separation between Shabbos and weekday. But we do these mitzvahs over wine. And similarly, Bech HaSamozim is a mitzvah that in the optimal manner should be done over wine. In the past, and to this day, many in Eretz Yisrael, every single Bech HaSamozim, every benching will do it over wine. Um, in Europe and in North Africa, the minhag became not to do regular benching over wine due to the cost of obtaining grape juice and wine. In the past, it was very expensive. And the minhag became that one only did benching over wine when it was a formal su'udah, like a chasna or the like. Though many people um, do still say it's over wine when there's a uh, mzuman. Now, why is Bechah Samazan done over wine? Why are some mitzvahs done over wine and others not? After all, uh, when we blow the shofar in shul, we don't say Bechah and the answer is that mitzvahs which are connected with elevating the physical are set over wine, because wine is a, a strong drink, an alcoholic drink. It could be something very secular and material and mundane. Nonetheless, we elevate it and see it as a source of kedusha and sanctity. And so many mitzvahs which are connected with elevating the physical, we do over wine. Um, so benching, we've just eaten a meal, Therefore, we do the Birch HaSamozan over wine, Sunni Kiddush, which is connected to Shabbos, and uh, Havdalah, which is connected to Shabbos, which is an intensely physical and material mitzvah. We elevate it by doing it over wine. And the other mitzvahs which we do over wine are marriage, Kiddushin. Um, every chuppi you've attended, you will note that there's always a bracha made over wine. In fact, twice we make a bracha over wine. What has marriage got to do with wine? And the answer again is because a relationship, marriage, could be viewed as something material, as something physical, and we elevate it, we recognize that this is a time of Kedusha. And similarly, we do a brismila, a circumcision over wine, for similar reasons. So mitzvahs which are about elevating the physical are done over wine, and therefore Bechus HaMazan is said over wine. Now, since Bechus HaMazan is said over wine, one might be concerned that the harachmans are a hefzak, an interruption between the benching and saying it over wine, because after all, we finish benching by saying Ali Chasreinu, and the Rachmans are merely additions to it. And therefore, there were post who were opposed to the habit of saying Rachman. Nonetheless, we do say Rachman because this is considered to be a continuation of the theme of the last bracha, in which we ask for the mercy of Hashem. So this was one concern expressed around the idea of um, saying Rachmans. A second concern around them was, that they are really quite um, pleading to fill us. And on Shabbos, at least, we avoid bakasha, we avoid pleading to um, Hashem in a sort of desperate manner, because this isn't in line with Shabbos. Nonetheless, we say harachamon in Beir HaSamazan. And again, there were post including the Vilna Gaon, who opposed this practice. Um, and in the case of the Rachmans, there's a concern on Shabbos of saying them because of um, pleading with Hashem. And indeed, the Vilna Gaon and those that follow his practice do not say these Rachmans. Nonetheless, our practice is that we do, and we're not concerned about the Hefzik, as explained, and we're also not concerned about Shabbos, because since it's part of a fixed text of Tefillah, um, we don't need to change the text for Shabbos. We avoid extra bakoshas, extra requests in Shabbos, but we don't need to alter the text of the standard Tefillah, and therefore our practice is that we say the Harachmans. I'm not going to go through all the Harachmans. However, I do want to highlight a few of them. Um, one, some of which are, are very interesting, and uh, um, one of which is very important also. Now, of all the Harachmans, one and one only is actually based on the Gemara rather than the Geonim, who introduced them late in history. And this is a very brief Harachman that we say, in which we say, Harachman Yuvarich as Bal Habayis Hazer. We ask God, the merciful one, to have mercy on us and bless our host. And this is based on a Gemara in Brachus. The Gemara in uh, Brachus, Mem Vav Omadalev, says that one should always daven for the host at whose table one ate. And therefore, this Harachman, who you've of Balabai Zazer, is the only one of the Harachmans which really doesn't date back just to the Gaonim, but dates all the way back to the Gemara. Because the Gemara says one should daven for one's host at the end of uh, um, when one eats a meal at a host. Now, the text of the Gemara is a much lengthier um, 
prayer of, for the host. Um, it's printed in some of the benches and some of the Sidurim. It's a very extensive and beautiful prayer. And it's very nice to fill up to say for one's host. However, um, the minhag is that we just say this brief, though some have the practice of saying the lengthier to fill up for a host, but certainly um, the mainstream minhag is just to say the short, and if one is a regular um, at someone else's table, that one can suffice with that, or children who are eating at their parents' table can suffice with just saying the short, fulfilling the halacha of the Gemara. Um, someone who is an occasional guest, um, many have adopted the practice, which really is bought in Shulchan Aruch and dates, uh, as I said, back to the Gemara, are saying the more extensive the Yerotzon, which is printed in some of the Sidurim. So that's one of the Harachmans to highlight, a Harachman which really, in essence, draws its power from the Gemara, which says that a guest should pray for a host in the meal and um, express appreciation to the host. Um, highlighting a couple of the other texts of the uh, Harachmans, all of which are very, very interesting. Um, I'll, I'll comment on uh, perhaps two features in the time that we have available in the Harachmans. Um, and translate two terms which come up a lot of times in tefillah in general and are difficult to translate. And this is the text of Harachamon Yishtabach Ledor Dorim. Hashem may be, he be, um, Yishtabach means he shall praise for generations. Vispoa Bonu Lad, may he be glorified through us forever. Ola Netzach Nutzochim. Now, Netzach Nutzochim, Netzach is translated as eternity or infinity. For all eternity, and may he be uh, um, honored through us, forever, forever, for olam olamim forever. Now these phrases are a little bit difficult to translate. What exactly do they mean? So first of all, we talk about Hashem being honored through us. A very remarkable idea that we have the ability to bring honor to Hashem through our behavior. Okay. But this is then described as for all eternity, or for all eternity. So what's the translation of the word Olam? So Olam is often translated as the world. Um, you'll see, for example, Adon Olam, Hashem, Molach, Terem, Kol, etc. Translated as master of the universe. But actually, the correct translation of the word Olam, um, based on how we see it used in the Pesukim, for example, Vavodo, the Olam, as a servant who has their ear pierced, serves Hashem, serves their master, Le'olam. Le'olam means forever, for eternity. So Adon Olam HaShemodach probably shouldn't be translated as master of the universe, but probably Adon Olam, master of eternity, or eternal master. So Le'olam means for all eternity. What does Le'netzach Nutzachim mean? For infinity, for forever. So the word Netzach, Samson um, Afalash, or Samson Afalash, links to the word Nitzachin, um, which is victorious. Le'netzach is to be um, victorious. Um, which is, um, introduces many verses into him, means for the conductor. The conductor um, is, is guides and leads and brings together and makes sense of um, the whole choir or the whole orchestra. Um, in a victory, you guide and lead and sort of shape the world into the shape that you want it to have. So the root of, of Lonetzach is, is, um, is this idea of uh, um, victory and guidance and leadership and conducting and uh, shaping the world into the form that you, uh, um, that you want it to have. So in Netzach Nutzachim, when we refer to it as infinity, as eternity, we mean molded into the form that Hashem wants it to have. Le'ome Elam, which also means eternity, may be linked to the word um, oleim, to be hidden, that which is hidden, that which is concealed. So ome elame means eternity, the future, lost in the midst of time and concealed from us. And the netzach mitzachim refers to the future in the sense of the future in which Hashem has molded the universe into the direction that he wants it to go. So when we daven the netzach mitzachim, or ome elame, we use two phrases to reference the future. One, the fact that the future is concealed and hidden from us. And secondly, the future, which is Netzach Nutzachim, which is molded into the form and image that we want, uh, that Hashem will eventually bring it to have. So these are two expressions of eternity, reflecting two different aspects 
the fact that the universe is going in a particular direction, the world is going in a particular direction, being led by the master conductor who will form it into the shape that it needs to be formed. And then Netzach Mosachim, we reference Hashem as, that, who, as, as he who is victorious over everything that will be and conducts everything that will be, brings the world into the shape that it's meant to have. So this is that bracha. We also, in a very famous and beautiful text, we daven harachman hu yishlach lonu es ediyahu hanovi zochur atoiv. We, we ask that uh, Hashem should send to us Eliyahu Anovi. Eliyahu's role is that of the Mavase. Vivase Lonu, Besoris Tovis Yushos Lechamos. He will proclaim or announce to us the good news, the news of the coming of Mashiach. Now, Eliyahu's association with um, the role of announcing the coming of Mashiach is really dates back to um, the last Pasuk or last Pasukim in Nach. The very last Novi um, to say the words of Nevuah of Hashem was Malachi. And in the very closing words of the whole of Seif Nevi'im, Malachi um, says the following, es I'm going to send you Elio, um, before the coming of the day of Hashem, the fearful day of Hashem, the great day of Hashem, the Yom Hadin, the day of judgment, etc. And Elio will have the role of bringing um, children back to parents and parents back to children, you will return the world to, to Shuvah. So this is the role of ADO. He is the Mavasa, the one that brings in or heralds in the, um, the time of Moshiach. Um, from a halachic point of view, the, the reason why ADO is chosen for this role is because he represents the unbroken chain of Masura of tradition. Um, Elio Hanavi, who ascended to Shamayim and didn't die, is, was one of the Bali Masura, was one of those who received the Torah in the chain of, of tradition. If Elio was Pinchas, according to Samin Chazal, then he literally learned Torah from Moshe himself. If he wasn't Pinchas, but he was Elio, then he was a Talmud of the students of Moshe. But either way, Elio is one of the chain of tradition, the unbroken chain of tradition. We have lost this chain of tradition because we no longer have um, smicha. We no longer have an unbroken chain of tradition um, in the highest level. Um, we nowadays use the title smicha, rabbinic ordination, for someone who is allowed to teach Torah. But the original smicha that was given was an unbroken chain of master to student, teacher to student, rabbi to Talmud, dating back to Moshe Rabbeinu, lost in the era following the destruction of Beis Amikdash under Roman persecution. And that chain of Samicha has been lost. What we nowadays call Samicha is just permission to Paschal, but it isn't part of this unbroken chain of Samicha. And therefore, for the bringing in of the era of Moshiach, we need someone who is able to restore the unbroken Masora, someone who is able to have, have true ordination, which allows the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court, to be reset up, who can recognize and acknowledge the role of Moshiach, and allow Moshiach halachically to be appointed as a king, which needs the Sanhedrin to do so. And this is why Elio's role is crucial in being the Mavasa, the herald of Moshiach from a halachic point of view, because he can restore the chain of genuine Samicha and allow Sanhedrin to be re-established, to recognize Moshiach, to, to declare and create Moshiach as the Melech, as the king, and restore the lost traditions which have been lost over the millennia. Um, that's the role of ADO. In the Gemara, according to some reasons, the Gemara, he's also described the role of returning and restoring the answers to questions which have been lost, re-establishing the tradition, the Masura. So this is the tefillah, the prayer that we have for ADO Hanavi, who is the um, one who heralds Mashiach. Moving on through the text of uh, Benching, I just want to use the last few minutes available to highlight um, maybe two more interesting features of three more, uh, if I have time, three more interesting features of Bircha Samazen. Um, the first is the famous um, edition of Harachman that we say on Shabbos. Harachman yam chileni yom shekule Shabbos um nochel chayelamim. But we also make another chain, change to the text of Bircha Samazen. And on Shabbos and Yom Tov we say Migdol Yeshua Smalkai. Whereas on weekdays, we say Magdil Yeshua's Malkut. So what's that about? Why is there that change of text between Magdil and Migdol between weekday and Shabbos? So the origin of this phrase, 
Magdzili Yeshua's Malko or Migdzili Yeshua's Malko is um, something about the Yeshua's Malko, the salvation of his king, either Magdil or Migdil. Magdil is a causative verb. Um, he, um, he should make great the Yeshua's Malko, the salvation of his king, referring to Hashem. Whereas Migdil Yeshua's Malko is referring to, I'm sorry, the king, Moshiach or David HaMelech. Whereas Migdol Yeshua's Malko is, he is the um, greatness of the salvation of his king, or it's sometimes translated as Migdol, a tower, Migdol, a tower. So Magdil is a causative verse. Basically, we turn to Hashem and say, Hashem is the one who makes great, he should make great the redemption of his king of David and Moshiach. Um, on the other hand, Migdol Yeshua's Malko, doesn't say Hashem should make great as a cause to verse, but it describes a fact. Hashem is the one who is the tower of strength of the Yeshua's Malko, of the salvation of his king, of David and Moshiach. So where do these two texts come from? So the background to the story is that um, David HaMelech was saying praise, singing praise to Hashem. And he sang a shura, thanks to Hashem. Why did he sing a shura? On the day that Hashem saved him, from the hands of his enemies and the hands of Shaul. So David, as we know, was persecuted for much of his life. He was persecuted by enemies, and he was persecuted by a great man who was not his enemy, but who hated him, Shaul Hamelas, the great Shaul. On the day that David was saved from them, he sang a shira, a praise to Hashem for finally ending his um, misery and his suffering and the persecutions that he experienced. Now, interestingly, we have two texts of this shura. We have a text that records it in Shmuel, in Shmuel base, in the second book of uh, Shmuel, of Sefer Shmuel. And we have a text that records it in Tehillim chapter Yudches. So in Perik Kaf base, Shmuel base, and Tehillim Yudches. And the two texts of these shura, of this song of praise Hashem, are very similar, except with one crucial difference. In Tehillim, it says, Magdil Yeshua's Malko. Hashem should bring greatness and redemption, the redemption to his king, to David. Whereas in Shmuel, in Shmuel it says, Migdol Yeshua's Malko. Hashem is the tower of strength for his king, for David. So during the weekday, we say the request form, Hashem should bring strength to his king. On Shabbos, we say the statement form, Hashem is the tower of success for his king referencing the difference between Shabbos and weekday. On Shabbos, as we discussed, we try and avoid um, needless requests, and therefore we declare this um, in praise of Hashem as a statement that Hashem is the tower of the strength of David, as opposed to in the weekday in which we daven magdil, causative verb, he should bring strength. That's one reason for the change between weekday and Shabbos. Um, there's another couple of reasons for this change. Um, according to Chazal, David wrote this song of praise in reference to Tehillim before he became the king, whereas the version in Shmuel he wrote after he became the king, and therefore it's considered the greater version, and therefore the one that's set on Shabbat. Similarly, the version in Tehillim is from Ksuvim, whereas the version in Shmuel is from the Nevi'im, from the book of the prophets, and the Nevi'im is considered to be a higher level, a greater sanctity, a greater level of prophecy, and therefore on Shabbat we say the higher level with a greater level of prophecy, Whereas in the weekday, we say the lower level of the lower level of prophecies. These are some of the reasons why we change the text of the bracha from one to the other. Um, I just want to use the minute left available to me um, to, to comment on a couple of psukim that we quote in um, Yer, 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 um, Yeres Hashem of that Hashem, um, that, that the Holy Ones fear HaKadosh Baruch Hu, um, there's a very difficult pasuk that we say, um, in which we say, Dor Hashem those who seek Hashem should um, never lack any good. And we also say, Na Yisi come to come to you, Yisi Satanezov, Vizaro Mavakish Lochem. I was young and I was old, and I never saw a tzaddik deserted and whose children are seeking bread. Now, clearly and tragically, um, there are tzaddikim, there are righteous people who suffer extreme, extreme poverty. So what are we meant to make of this line? That lower isi tzaddik nezav is aron rakish lochem. So the number of ways of understanding this line, um, the malbim and uh, various other mafoshim understand it to mean 
that Hashem will never neglect the children of Tzadikim in the long run. Um, other Mepharshim understand it to mean Tzadik Ne'ezov, the Tzadik, even when they go through hard times, doesn't consider themselves forsaken. Or Zarim Vakishlochem, even though the Tzadik's children may be impoverished, um, other people will help and give tzedakah and support, and there's no shame in needing the help of others. Um, the tzaddik who needs to rely on the support of others, it recognizes this as the position Hashem has put him in, and therefore is able to take that support. Um, just to conclude, the concluding psukim of the core part of benching, are and in the addition of the psukim that we say, we again finish with Hashem Yavarich Es Amor Yavashonim, Hashem should um, bless his people with peace. Um, we conclude all to fill us with a request for peace, um, normally using this language of Osa Shalom and Romov. So we finish benching with Osa Shalom and Romov, Yasa Shalom We finish Kaddish with it. We finish the Amidah, Shimon Esra, when we step back with it. And this is based on the idea that all brachas should finish with peace. The Gemara describes peace as a Kli Machsik Racha, as the um, essential um, utensil to contain blessing. You can have all the blessings in the world, but if you don't have peace, you can't appreciate them, you can't absorb them, you can't contain them. So one always needs peace in order to um, contain bracha. This is indeed the theme in Bechas Konim, this week, etc. Um, that's where the Gemara comments that Shalom is the bracha, that's the Klimachs of bracha. And therefore, we have um, adopted the practice of finishing all our prayers with a request for peace. And I, in turn, will finish this mini-series on Brechas Amazon with the tefillah, particularly at the hard and difficult times that we are going through um, as Jews throughout the world and in Eretz Israel in particular. Hashem Yavarich Es Amoi Hashalom. May Hashem grant us all peace. Amen. And thank you so much, as always, for joining this um, series. Um, I look forward next week to starting the new series. Um, so please watch this space. I'm open to suggestions as um, which mitzvah now to look at in more detail in our A to Z of mitzvahs, of halacha, and understanding my mitzvahs. So please um, forward me suggestions and watch the short communication to decide to see what we decide on as our next mitzvahs. Once again, thank you as our next series. Once again, thank you so much for joining. Hashem Yavarich, Hashem Yavarich, Amen. Thank you so much, Rabbi Zob.